I'm mentioning the second part of the source. Never merely as a means. So there's a prohibition on using people as a means only. But there's a second point, uh, perhaps a distinct point. There's a requirement that we treat people as ends in themselves. And these are not exactly the same. Um, in other words, there seems to be the possibility of adhering to the prohibition on using people as means only. Right? So I can refrain from using you as a means only, but also not treat you as an end in yourself. And what I'm suggesting is that the prohibition on using people as a means only, you could think of as generating perfect duties. You may not treat people as a means only. That's going to rule out as impermissible certain actions. Treating people as an end in themselves is going to generate imperfect duties, requirements that you treat them in a certain way. Um, so let me give an example of how, well, so um, let me give an example of how I could use a person as a means only. Um, so if I, um, so to speak, well, well so if I, um, if I use a person, um, if I trick a person into pursuing my end, so, or if I force a person into my end, if I hold a gun to you and I say, um, give me all your money, I've forced you to act in a way that treats you as a means, as a means to my end of getting rich or whatever it is. Um, so that's violating a perfect duty that's going to be using people as somebody as a means. But here, um, if I simply ignore somebody, I'm not using them. If I'm indifferent to them, if I don't care about their end, I'm not using them for my purposes, but I'm not recognizing them as a source of value. Well, as I say, I'm not using the person as a means only, but uh, I'm not respecting them as an end in themselves either. Um, so I think that these two requirements at least roughly correspond to the perfect imperfect um, contrast. Is that clear? Should I say that again? Right. So uh, one of the one of the positive duties is the duty of beneficence to take a person's ends, or rational ends, as good. If I don't do that, uh, I haven't treated them as an end in themselves, but I haven't used them either. I mean, that was supposed to be the example, that I'm not, um, that I'm indifferent to their ends. Okay, um, so that was the first point, that there are two parts here and you need to be aware. Second, um, this requirement um, doesn't rule out cooperation. So cooperation freely entered into by both parties is not using somebody. So the point is that what is prohibited here is using somebody as a means only. Um, so you should be thinking of um, doing something behind a person's back, so to speak, or behind the back of their reason, working around their rational ability to set and pursue that. Um, so treating them, really what's being ruled out here is treating somebody as if they didn't have a will, as if they didn't have the capacity to rationally set and pursue their own ends. Um, okay. Now we come to the important and that is this. Haven't I been saying all along, from the 
very, very beginning that Kant rejects the idea that there is a single end toward which all moral actions are directed. And isn't this supposed to be the big difference between Kantian deontological ethics and teleological views? And now here he is talking about certain ends as necessary ends as the basis of morality. So, doesn't Kant reject the idea that there is a single end of moral action? And now we're talking about people as ends in, the, ends in themselves, and somehow that's what is our test of morality. Um, so, really the question that we have to ask is, what does it mean for something to be an end in itself? Because that's what this claim is here, that human beings are ends in themselves. Um, well, first of all, what it means is that uh, the value of this thing, a will, person, is supposed to be unconditional. And it's supposed to be, therefore, independent of the desire, the empirical desires or the inclinations that anyone happens to have. Second, um, since I've explained to you that there's no teleological pre-moral good toward which all moral actions are directed, the value of an end in itself can't be like a state of affairs to be brought about. And that's right. Unfortunately, Kant doesn't really explain this very well until later on. So if you uh, jump ahead to page 49 at 437, he distinguishes the idea of um, an end to be brought about, to be effected, and an independently existing end. So uh, on 49 at 437, just about maybe a third of the way down the page, he says, the end must here be thought not as an end to be effected, and to be achieved and in a state of affairs that we're aiming at. The end must here be thought not as an end to be effected, but as an independently existing end. A person is like something that already exists and is therefore valuable in itself. And hence, only negatively, he says, not an end to be brought about, but as something that we think of as independently valuable, and hence thought of only negatively, that is, that we must never be con it that is that which must never be contravened in action, and which must therefore be esteemed in every willing, never merely as a means, but always at the same time as an end, an end in itself. Okay, so um, doesn't Kant reject the idea that there is a single end of all moral action? Yes, he does reject that. There's no end to be brought about that all actions, all moral actions, aim at. So, an end in itself is not a goal to be achieved, but what he calls here an independently existing end, a source of value. And it's something which must never be contravened in action. Um, so, Kant's claim is not that there is some state of affairs that all moral actions are aimed to bring about, um, but that moral actions are always done out of respect for um, these uh, independently existing sources of value. So, I mean, think about it in a ridiculous way. Suppose you thought that Kant was saying that human beings are ends in themselves, and if you were thinking of that as an end to be achieved, a state of affairs to be accomplished, well, you might say that their VAP human beings are ends in themselves, they're valuable for their own sake, and therefore, what we should do is try to accomplish as much of that end as possible. Well, the conclusion is then that we 
what morality is about is creating as many people as possible. That's clearly not what he has in mind. He's not thinking of people as ends to be accomplished, to be achieved, to be effective. Instead, they are intrinsic sources of value when they exist. That's what it means to be an end in itself. Um, and notice the claim, finally, is also that it's all of humanity. Anyone with a will, anyone with practical reasoning um, that has intrinsic value, that is an end in itself. Not only good wills, that is not only wills when acting upon proper maxims, not only virtuous individuals. Um, so, all rational wills, all wills with a capacity to act for practical reasons are ends in themselves. Ends in themselves give themselves ends to be accomplished. They, what, are, what, are, what are we talking about? Wills that will certain ends on the basis of maxims. So those wills are intrinsically valuable. What about the ends that are willed by a person. One more time. So uh, the claim here is that uh, all wills, even ones that are not particularly virtuous, are intrinsically valuable and not to be acted against. Um, they have, again, intrinsic value. But now I'm pointing out that wills will ends, and I'm asking whether the, val the intrinsic value of a will, for a practical reason, is transferred to the conditional value of the end that they will. So the state of affairs that's maybe contingently good, rather than being intrinsically good, um, Say one more time. So uh, all, all all people have intrinsic value, whether they're especially virtuous or not. What about the ends that they will? Right. Right. So the point is that sometimes they are not going to be rationally willed. Sometimes we imperfectly rational beings will on the basis of an impermissible maxim. And I want you to notice the divergence at this point. The person is still intrinsically valued, is still an end in herself. The end, if not rationally will, is not good. So acting against a person, using a person as a means only, is going to be always impermissible. But pursuing their ends, the ends that they will, is not always going to be required. For beneficence, we, uh, we don't have to help people accomplish their bad ends. Oh, so you're only like required to help them if it's going to be rationally willed. If, will and if their ends are rationally willed. Yeah, okay. Good. Glad it makes sense. <laughs> On the other hand, notice that acting in a way contrary to their capacity to set and pursue ends is always wrong. So killing somebody, for example, is a way of interfering with their capacity to set and pursue ends. That's acting against the intrinsic value of a person. 